what we're doing is, uh, yeah, everyone of us uh, has a smartphone and we've got a range of sensors in there. Um, you all have an accelerometer, trust me. Um, you all have a microphone, that's something you probably know. Um, and most of our phones also have a gyroscope, a magnetometer, and a light sensor. And we can use all these sensors in physics experiments. Why would we do it? Why would we do this? Um, first of all, it's always a nice motivation for the students um, to do something different. I mean, uh, everybody who teaches in any context knows this. Um, we have to present something new every day to get that attention. And um, if as a teacher you go in front of your class and take your smartphone and put it into a salad spinner, uh, you get the attention from the students at least for five minutes, I think. Um, so this, of course, is a nice first thing, but of course this will wear, wear off quickly. Um, but then for high schools uh, especially, it's nice to have um, a tool for measurements uh, for individual students, for projects, for example. Um, and also, uh, I think it's probably the same in Taiwan because it's been it's the same all over, uh, all around the world. Um, high schools are usually underfunded for physics experiments. Um, at least in Germany they are, and uh, I know in the US they also confirmed that that's the same problem. So you can do some experiments with, with just the tools that you already have. Um, and then still spend money on other experiments because of course you cannot do everything with the phone. Um, so uh, in high school you can imagine to use this um, in, in such a way that either you use on demonstration or you can uh, let the students use their own phones. Um, that's usually good to let them work in small groups. So to make sure that everybody has a phone to work with because of course there are differences between the phones. Um, for me myself, as I um, um, teach at the university, uh, there's a fourth reason to do something like this. Um, and that is that um, we actually have a lecture with a group of, well, let's say about 300 students, which looks a bit like this. Um, okay, I can say this is our old, uh, old lecture hall, we got a new fancy one, but uh, nevertheless it's 300 students. And, um, the lecture, uh, this lecture was actually called uh, Experimental Physics. But one of the students actually did any experiments. Uh, instead, they just sat in their chairs and um, watched our lecture just in the same way they would watch um, a YouTube video. Um, and so they simply uh, had a look at what we were doing on stage. We had a lot of demonstration experiments, but there was no experimentation by the students. And uh, we could actually change this um, because yeah, every one of these students had a measurement tool in their pocket. Um, so we had no chance to actually uh, hand out the voltage meters or something like this uh, to each student, but all the students already had the device. So let me give you a short example of what an experiment like this could look like. Um, I will explain later how to actually do this. Um, so yeah, um, this is uh, just an iPhone. Um, and, oops, no, I didn't want to start it over, sorry. And here we have a live view of the data from the iPhone. Okay, so if I'm shaking it like this, you see the acceleration along the y-axis, which is this one, or uh, the z-axis, which is perpendicular to the screen. Okay, so here you now have the live picture of the accelerometer in this phone. Um, so let's do an example. I'll just um, switch the um, experiment. Now I'm going to an experiment called centripetal acceleration. And you can already imagine what I'm going to do. I'm measuring the centripetal acceleration. So let me re-enable this connection. Um, this experiment now looks a bit different, and I will place the phone in this salad spinner. And it's a bit hard to do the experiment while talking, so let me first tell you what I'm do, going to do. I will measure the um, rotation speed of the centrifuge um, using the gyroscope in the iPhone. And I will measure the centripetal acceleration, or centrifugal acceleration if you prefer the other frame of reference, um, using the accelerometer. Okay, so and I will shortly put away the microphone to demonstrate this. As you can see, 
I can see in real time what speed I'm doing. So I can do these slow rotations to add some data points down there. Or go a bit faster, okay, if I had two hands right now, um, to get some more data points up there. And as you can see, the result is actually quite impressive because that's pretty much a textbook result. You would expect a square relationship between the angular velocity and the um, centripetal acceleration. And that's pretty much what you got. So, um, also if we plotted the square relationship down here, I think it's a bit hard to see probably, um, you see it's a straight line. So, you can do really nice experiments with these tools. And that's what we did in our lecture. Um, so this was one of our very first experiments. Um, we didn't really think that much uh, yet at that point on how to do this with the students. So we showed this on stage. The students really loved it. And um, after that, we uh, gave them an assignment, so some kind of homework. Um, they should repeat this experiment. Um, so they already knew what the result would look like. But uh, all they had to do was um, do the same experiment, but with their own setup. They should document the setup for us. Uh, some of them even shot videos. Um, so I can show you what our students did. Um, and they only should show that the results looked quite good. And as you see, they really had some fun. Uh, those even used different camera angles and everything. Um, and what we learned from this was, uh, well, on one hand, our students don't have salad spinners. Uh, they have bicycles and office chairs. Um, and the other thing is that they really uh, were quite creative to do this. I mean, of course, it's easy to motivate them, those are physics students, um, but um, yeah. Um, actually, uh, at this point, uh, it would be good to mention that some of these experiments um, look a bit dangerous to the phone. Um, so, uh, of course, you have to, wear of the, have to be aware of this. Um, but so far, we just hit um, 250,000 installations uh, just yesterday for our app. And so far, I haven't heard of any incident where phone got broken. Because usually, the students think about the situation and they are aware that they are doing something different. Um, okay, so then we asked our students um, yeah, what they thought about this type of experiment. Sorry, this uh, questionnaire was in German. So let me just tell you what it's saying there. So this line reads, PFOX is fun and motivating. And uh, this means they totally agree, they agree, they disagree, and they disagree strongly. Okay, so. Uh, the students seem to enjoy this. So we went one step further and we decided to um, yeah, do something that cannot be done without this type of experiment. We gave them another assignment um, to build a pendulum and determine the pendulum frequency. Um, but this time we did this before we showed the experiment and even before we discussed how a pendulum works, or the math behind the pendulum. Okay, so um, as we're at the university, some of the students probably already knew uh, how this worked from high school, uh, but unless they looked this up, um, they were supposed to do a blind experiment. So they simply created a pendulum, again we received a few videos from them, um, and um, they should use the phone to determine the frequency of the pendulum, and um, then they should send us their results without really knowing um, what the relation between the string length of the pendulum and the frequency of the pendulum is. So we had this form, again, sorry, this thing is in German because the lecture was in German. So they saw this form in an, on a web page where they also had the script or the information of what we, we've shown in the, in the lecture. And they had to enter the length of the pendulum and the frequency they got. And then in the lecture, when we actually discussed the three theory behind this, um, we told them, we do not have to do this experiment on stage now, because everyone in the lecture room has already done this experiment, and this is the collective result of all the students. Okay, so each student um, sent us one, two, or three data points, um, and we could simply tell them all the things we discussed, all the theory we now um, derived, um, actually matches what you did before, well, except for those three who hopefully will become theoretical physicists. But uh, besides that, um, yeah, it matches quite well. And so the students became a part of the lecture. Okay, so uh, they, of course they were still sitting in their seats and uh, watching the lecture passively because you cannot do anything else with 300 people. But um, nevertheless, they felt like being a part of the lecture because it's their data that has been discussed at this point. Okay, so let me now tell you um, how to do this kind of experiment. Um, for this, we create our own app. It's called PFOX. Um, already seen this on the title screen. It stands for Physical Phone Experiments. 
Um, and it's free and it has the same function on Android and iOS, which is quite important because if you want to get 300 students to work with their phones, you cannot exclude a few of them simply because they have an iPhone or an Android device, so it should be the same. Um, at this point, may I ask if um, who of you already knew that you could do this kind of stuff with, with a smartphone? Not necessarily with our app, but with any app. Who's already seen something like this? Okay, a few? Okay. Uh, because at this point, I should mention, uh, even though we wrote this app, we are definitely not the first people to, uh, to do this. Um, there have been quite a few apps, um, quite famously um, Physics Toolbox uh, from um, American developers, uh, which were already doing this. So the question would now be, why did we create our own app and what's different to all the other apps? Um, the point is, the other apps are what I would call sensor logging apps, because they simply only provide the sensor data. What I just showed at the beginning, okay, when I moved the phone and you could saw the raw data. Problem with this is um, that um, this quickly gets uh, difficult for the students, even at the university level, or at least to lose some motivation. There are a lot of publications where they um, do some, um, uh, where they suggest an experiment um, with a smartphone where the students should go into an elevator, place the phone on the ground, so a, a, yeah, a lift, an elevator, um, and then measure the acceleration of the elevator as it goes up. And the next step would be, okay, we go to some um, computer lab room, where we transfer all the data into the PC, and we open it in Excel, and then do some numerical integration, and that's finally at this point the students have lost all their motivation, and when they get home and the parents ask them, okay, what did you do today in science class, or physics class, um, they would tell their parents did something strange in Excel, something with numeric integration, but they do not even remember the experiment they did. So what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to create yes, almost like a toy, something to really work with and where you get the data result right in your hand. So our app does uh, data analysis, and I think this is the right point to actually uh, the right moment to actually show the app. A second. I hope this works. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> Okay, let's try again. Yeah, there, there it is. Sorry, I have another experiment open right now. So this is our app. And um, as I said, it's free. You can simply download it from the uh, App Store or from the Play Store. Um, at the top, these experiments are what the other apps do. This is just to get the raw data from certain sensors. And we've got a whole range of other experiments down here, specific to other, uh, yeah, to, with data analysis in certain ways to show the data. For example, what I just did with the uh, set spinner over there was the centripetal acceleration experiment. So, um, yeah, instead of doing this experiment blindly and then transferring the data to Excel to somehow plot it and see the results, you could instead see in real time what you're doing and really understand your experiment. And as I just uh, told you about the uh, example with the elevator, um, this is what the elevator experiment looks like in our app. So this is an elevator at home in Aachen, goes about four, five floors. Um, here you see the acceleration from the accelerometer. So now the elevator will start. Will start, yeah, there. Um, and we are measuring the height um, covered by the elevator using the barometer. So yeah, most, many phones have a barometer, so we can get the height from there. And we can actually also determine the speed of the uh, elevator as a derivative from the, from the barometer data. So what the students can do with this is they can actually go to an elevator, um, start the ride, and then see in real time how these graphs form. Okay, especially in high school, it's not really easy to understand this type of graph for the first time, but it becomes really easy if you feel the acceleration of the elevator and see in real time how it is plotted in this chart. Okay, and um, of course it's also um, something they can really understand the kind of movement they just did, so they can relate it to this graph. Uh, it's also quite interesting to simply be able to uh, use the tool to measure the speed of an elevator. Um, and actually, uh, here in Taipei, we've got a really impressive elevator. So on the first day I went here, I thought I'd, I'd try it out. So, yeah, don't have to tell you where I was. So, um, yeah, I'm all, it's already accelerating, so at one meter per square second, which is quite impressive. You can really feel this, I, I would say. Um, you see the, um, the velocity is increasing. Um, as you probably know, it should do like 60 kilometers per hour, which is a little bit over 16 meters per second. Um, and you, as you can see, that's what I got there. I cannot explain these two data points, or these three data points. There is, I think, something um, in, in the way that the, the pressure in, in, within the elevator is exchanged with the outside. Um, 
I actually contacted them and uh, maybe they can explain it to me if there's some kind of, um, of um, venting shaft in there that which allows the air to flow differently. So I cannot explain this bit. But besides that, um, yeah, I can I could measure the height difference in there. Um, notice this didn't start at zero because um, we start from the fifth floor. Um, I could uh, see the velocity they had, and uh, I think the acceleration chart of this section is really nice at this point. Okay, so this is a really tool you can take around with you and uh, explore the world. Um, also, um, since I don't have that much time, I will only shortly mention it. Um, each of these experiments, the, the full list here, um, is not static. So if you go on our website, there is an editor with which you can change each of these experiments um, that looks something like this. Okay. Um, and you can define which sensors are the inputs, which kind of map you want to apply, and how you want to show the results. Um, I'm not going into detail on this right now because, um, yeah, as I said, we don't have that much time. But if you're really interested in this, you can design your own experiments with your own data analysis. Simply download the experiment, and send it to your students, or transfer it to your phone, and uh, do whatever you want to do with this app. Um, maybe just a short example of this, what, what you can do. Um, would be um, yeah, this part here is an experiment which you cannot find in our app. It's something I created with the editor. Um, I tried to trace the sun over the day. I, yeah, I uh, tilt the phone. You can see the angle there changes. So I went into the sun, had the phone in a way that the area of the phone, of the shadow of the phone, is as small as possible, so it's aligned with the sun. And then I added the data points there. So what I did was two weeks ago I put in San Diego, which is this place. Um, then this one's in Germany. Um, as you can see here, we're farther in the north. Um, so yeah, to me the, the weather here is actually summer. Okay, so because German winter is uh, much colder than this. Um, and actually I'm trying to fill up in this thing here uh, in Taipei as well, but I cannot show much yet um, because uh, yeah, I, I hope to that uh, over the next um, day, uh, yeah, tomorrow and the rest of the day I have a few more chances. Uh, but the last days, the clouds made it difficult to actually fill in this third part. Uh, just as an example, so as I said, uh, you can create your own experiments. And then the third feature of our app, which is, makes it quite unique, is what you just saw at the beginning. Because if your phone is a cell spinner, you cannot control it. But I was still able to show you the data, and it wasn't through this um, yeah, annoying video stream interface, because um, uh, the, to be done, uh, oops, sorry, I rotated the phone, then it went away. Uh, so, who of you would know how to stream the video from your phone into a presentation? Anybody? Okay. Um, actually, it's also not a good idea to do this because what I'm streaming here is a full HD video because the resolution of this little thing is uh, ridiculous. Okay, so it's, um, yeah, it's full HD. I don't think that it needs to be, but nevertheless, it's full HD and I have to transfer all this data. And as you can see, if I move the screen, it takes a while until it updates over there, which is also not really nice, and I couldn't control anything from there. So what we do instead is what you saw at the beginning. I once again go into the simple acceleration experiment. You simply go into the menu, select allow remote access, then there's a little warning, I will say something about this later. Um, you confirm this dialog, and you get an URL down there. Uh, it might be hard to see from the left row. So it's just saying HTTP uh, 10.42.0.71. And I simply add, uh, enter this into a web browser. Actually, we are already in a web browser. Okay, so I enter this number here, uh, which was this one. Oops, was it this one? Yeah, there it is. And now I have the live data from the phone in here. Okay, so. And you see, it's much faster because it's only transferring the actual data and not uh, um, a video stream. Uh, another advantage of streaming the actual data is, um, well, we've got a channel to um, control it in the other direction, so I can delete the data from here, start it again, and stuff like this. And I can even download the data right on the PC. And if you want to, you can still have it go in Excel if you don't like how that channel is. Okay? So it becomes really easy to work with the data um, this way. Um, as I said, there was a little um, um, warning dialog at the, uh, before I started this, uh, this, this function. And the reason is, 
um, that anybody in the same network could control the experiment. So if you want to do this in front of, um, of your students, oops, um, you should not do it in the same network as a student. At least uh, if you're a high school teacher, there are only 20 or 30 students which you can have an eye on. This probably works, but in a huge lecture hall with 300 students, um, and you use it like this, uh, you can expect at least one of them to be so bored to actually log into your experiment and mess with it. Okay, so uh, you should probably set up your own network. Um, and here's some tips for to do this. Um, if you try out this remote access thing uh, at home, in your own Wi-Fi, it probably just works out of the box. Because at home, you've got your own yeah, Wi-Fi network, your notebook is in this network, your smartphone is in this network, it simply works. If you are at, um, at the university in a larger network, um, for example, at the room at this side here, um, I haven't tried it here, but uh, at the other room at my um, university, uh, it can be a bit tricky because the network is so huge that your smartphone and your notebook can be in different sub-networks. So um, you sh should not rely on this. As I said, it's also not a good idea to be in the same network as the students at this point. So what you can do instead, what I'm doing right now, is uh, set up a network from your smartphone. Each smartphone has a function that's called hotspot or tethering which is uh, meant to, to allow you to share your data connection with another device. And how is this? You have a network connection, and um, it's pretty much the fastest connection you can get, and there are no other devices in between, and nobody else can, can uh, mess with you. Um, also, if you want to use um, this, this function with more students, so the students should do it themselves, then of course this is also not a good solution, but then I would really suggest you simply grab an old Wi-Fi router, um, because uh, I'm not sure if it's here the same like in Germany, but probably it is. Um, we um, get a new standard for DSL and the, network connect, uh, the, uh, the internet connection every few, three, uh, few years, and then usually you need to get a new router. So if you still get an old Wi Fi router, it would work pretty well. Doesn't any special function, just set up a name that the students can understand, a simple password, and all your students can use this thing to do this communication. Then you have the students in uh, pairs of two. Um, so one phone can uh, do the experiment and the other phone can be used to control the experiment. Um, because the second device with, it, with which you control it, um, I mean I've just shown you, it works on my notebook, um, which actually runs uh, Linux, so um, that's nothing special like uh, Android or iOS, um, but it works, it works from, from Windows PC and a Mac PC, it works from, from iPhone, from Android, um, it actually works from any device that has a web browser, because the second device only needs a web browser, okay? So this would even work on a PlayStation. Okay, so you can control the experiment from PlayStation if you want to. I wouldn't suggest this, it's quite annoying to control this with the controller, but um, it works. All you need is a web browser, okay? Um, so now let me show you a few more examples and talk about the sensors. Um, once again, uh, at this point, I will go a little bit faster through these things because we don't have to, the time to discuss everything in detail. But after the session and after the break, uh, I will set up uh, hands-on activities uh, outside. Uh, I still have to find the right place where I have to do this, but um, this is a great chance for you uh, to get more information on each of the sensors. Okay? But uh, I'll give you a few examples and show you them right now. Um, so, we've got the accelerometer. And um, yeah, does anybody of you have an idea why we have an accelerometer in our phones? Anybody? Okay. Uh, probably nobody dares to, to speak up. <laughs> um, the reason is, uh, this is what allows your phone to realize when you rotate the device that it should rotate the screen. Did it? Yeah, it did. Um, because the accelerometer actually is not an accelerometer in the sense that it only measures acceleration as the change of velocity, but actually you can imagine that this is like a mass attached to a bunch of springs, um, and so it measures, um, so if you move your phone, um, the mass uh, gets moved as well, so you measure the acceleration, but also if you rotate it like this and the, the springs are in this direction, you can imagine that the Earth's acceleration also drags down this mass. So what it actually me measures is the Earth's acceleration and the acceleration of the phone. And uh, what, the, what the manufacturers of the phone are actually interested in is Earth's acceleration because this allows the phone to know the orientation. Okay, that's why you have an accelerometer in there. Um, so let me give you a little example of what you can do with this. Actually, this is a very small example, but it's something I could easily carry on, um, on a plane. Um, I've got a uh, hard disk drive here. And if I 
inputs. So actually, this is a broken hard disk drive. It doesn't really work anymore, but it's rotating. Um, yeah, now it's starting. And um, we can use the accelerometer meter to measure um, this uh, vibration of the hard disk drive. And um, yeah, you probably now have to believe here, you can check data. It says that it's rotating at 7,200 rotations per minute. Um, and I can now place my phone on top of this, start an experiment which does um, create transform of this data, and you see right away that the half disk drive is actually rotating at 120 Hz, which is 1200 RPM. Um, you can even see if I stop the half disk drive, um, how it starts to, uh, how it's, the, the way it stops and the frequency goes down. If I start it again, um, you should see it come up again. There it comes from the left. Okay, so this is a nice tool to simply measure your environment. Uh, you can also imagine a project for students to measure the actual frequency of a washing machine or something like that. Um, I just couldn't bring the washing machine on the plate. Okay, they, I, I could, but it would be really expensive. So, okay. um, this would be the accelerometer. Then we've also got a magnetometer. Anybody got an idea what we've got a magnetometer? Um, this is actually used as a compass. So if you're doing navigation, your GPS can tell you where you are. Um, and if you're in a car, that's good enough to get an orientation. Because if you're driving fast, then one location, then the next location, it knows the direction you're driving. Um, but if you're on the street and you try to figure out where you are, um, then yeah, just rotating around, um, the GPS doesn't help there. You need a magnetometer as a compass. That's why pretty much every phone has a magnetometer, except for quite cheap ones. Um, and what you can do with this, uh, actually there are quite a few details that you have to consider when using a magnetometer, but a very simple experiment um, is to simply use it to detect magnets, obviously. And uh, for this, I have this little uh, toy train here. So, uh, yeah, a Lego train, I think it was not here, right? Um, um, and what I did is, um, in the rail, there are four magnets. One's over here, one's over there, one's over here, and here's another one. Okay, so it's hard to see from the back, but in this whole um, circle, there are four magnets. And um, on the experiment, uh, so I used the experiment magnetic ruler, this also comes with our app. So once again, I have to enable this so you can see what I'm doing. I will enter the distance of the magnets, Measure this before, it's about half a meter, so it's about five millimeters. And what the app does now is um, while the train is moving, it uses the magnetometer to detect these magnets in there. So it takes a few, um, few centimeters to start. And now at each magnet, it will it simply adds 50 centimeters to the total distance, and then it uses this, uh, uses the timing of this to calculate the velocity. Okay, so this looks not really nice at this point, but if I increase the velocity, you will see right away that we got the different speed. Okay, can increase it even further. Oops, it's a little tight here. So, yeah, next uh, speed, and if I reduce the speed again, you will see that it drops right away, and uh, yeah, then you actually can add uh, a way to measure the speed and the distance traveled by the train simply with some magnets. Okay. So next one. Oh, let's stop this. Yeah, thank you. Um, next one is the gyroscope. Um, this is actually not a gyroscope, at least the name is not really good, but we decided to use the same name uh, everybody does, because otherwise people who know other apps will search for the gyroscope and our app won't find it. Um, but the gyroscope usually would be a huge, um, um, piece, uh, yeah, a huge mass which is spinning to keep the angular momentum at a certain uh, axis. Uh, and what you don't want in your phone is a huge mass that is spinning. Okay, so what we have there instead um, is um, a rotation rate sensor. And you've already seen this, this is the one I used to measure the rotation rate of the, the saddle spinner. Um, another example where we use this is for the string pendulum, which you've seen before, um, which the students built. Uh, because for this pendulum motion, you also have this rotation in there, which is easier to detect with the gyroscope than with the accelerometer. Um, 
Then we've got the light sensor. Um, actually, this is in almost every phone, but unfortunately on uh, iPhones we cannot access uh, the light sensor. And uh, actually, many phones uh, have very different light sensors, so this is, uh, the sensor should not use that much. Um, then we've got the pressure sensor. This is the one we use for the elevator. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the very few sensors which are a bit um, less common. Um, actually, you can find the sensor in the more expensive phones, so most iPhones have them, except for the iPhone SE, which is the cheaper iPhone. And if you've got an Android device which is at least half as expensive as an iPhone, you have a good chance to have the sensor as well. But um, for cheaper phones, unfortunately, you won't find this. So if you want to use this with the students, um, you need to make sure that they routinely put them up in groups so that the sensor is available. But just to give you an idea how great the sensor is, um, oops, sorry. Um, I will simply show on stage. If I um, yeah, move the phone upwards, you can see the pressure decreases. If I move the phone down, the pressure increases. Okay, so this is actually enough to, um, yeah, to, to measure the change of uh, atmospheric pressure at this point. And this is actually the reason um, that they put this pressure sensor in there. Um, because the idea is to use this for navigation, but GPS is not available. So, for example, in a, in a shopping mall or in the airport, when you've got navigation to find uh, the next McDonald's or something like that, you can tell the uh, floor on which you are. Okay. Um, then a very important sensor is the microphone. Many people don't think of it as a sensor, but it's um, one of the yeah, it's one of our best sensors because actually it's the fastest one. It's uh, measuring data at 48 kilohertz. Most of the other sensors only do 100 hertz. So for timing measurements, this is pretty much the fastest thing you can get. And uh, I will give a few examples on this later. And finally, finally we also have GPS. Um, this is nothing for the classroom, obviously, because it doesn't really work that well. And you need the distance of uh, meters usually to, to get a difference. But it's great. Using, uh, if you're doing something uh, in a car, on a bicycle, or maybe on a plane, okay? But um, not so great for a classroom, actually. Okay, so I just mentioned the microphone, and we quickly went over it. So uh, let me give you a few more details on this one, because the microphone and the speaker in your phone are very precise tools. As I said, um, they're doing 48 kilohertz, so it's doing 48,000 measurements per second. Um, and so this is a really precise instrument, which you otherwise won't find as a function generator. As a quick example, in our lecture, um, we usually do a resonance experiment to shed a wine glass, and we were able to use the, uh, our app to measure the frequency of the wine glass, then use the tone generator in our app to, um, get, to produce the same frequency. Then, of course, we needed an amplifier, because uh, no phone is long enough to actually um, yeah, shatter the wine glass. Um, but this experiment, which we usually do with a function generator, could simply be done in our app. And of course, I would show a video with it work, so uh, here we go. Bang. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, just as a demonstration on how pre precise these tools are. Okay. So, what you can do with this, obviously, is measuring uh, the amplitude of, uh, of the sound. But I have to tell you right away, um, this won't work that way. Because the problem is, our app is available on more than 10,000 devices, um, so um, yeah, you cannot really have all these devices and calibrate them, because each device has a slightly different microphone, slightly, slightly different application circuits, maybe some different software which filters out the background noise. So uh, analyzing amplitudes is not that great unless you have some tools to calibrate the phone. Uh, you can analyze frequencies. Um, which works quite well. Um, for example, um, the, the measurement of the heart, heart distract could also be done acoustically, but um, it has to be quite for this because the little, the little noise it makes um, is not that loud. And we've got one tool which we call the acoustic stopwatch. Um, this is a very handy tool because it's very easy to understand for students. Um, let me show this one. Um, because what it does is it simply measures the time between two acoustic, uh, acoustic events. So it looks like this. We've got two settings, a threshold, which is the sensitivity of this thing, and a minimum delay, which simply avoids uh, mistriggering from echoes. So what I can do now, if I start this, nothing happens, but if I make a sound, the measurement starts, and the second sound, it stops again. And um, so this is a tool which is understandable for really young students already. 
and uh, it's a very versatile tool. Um, one experiment, um, yeah, which I didn't set up in time, but which I can hopefully show you also uh, later uh, uh, outside, is uh, measuring the um, free fall time. So the idea would be, um, you put a little balloon in the stand, the weight below this, and then you pop the balloon, which is the starting noise, so the weight starts to drop, and the impact on the ground is the stopping noise, and you can easily measure the, the time of the free fall. I would say in this case, the first experiment down to about 10 milliseconds. So in theory, you can even do milliseconds, uh, because um, you can even go below milliseconds in theory, because the 48 kilohertz, uh, we are far below milliseconds. But in practice, it's a little bit more difficult, because a sound like this doesn't start uh, instantaneously. Um, you have to consider at which time you go above the threshold, um, and especially if you have set up a different uh, sound sources, or if the sound is not reproducible, you still get a larger error than this. But uh, it's not unreasonable to actually show milliseconds there. Um, actually, one experiment, uh, which is uh, a really nice thing to do with, with this tool, is measuring the speed of sound in a very simple way. Uh, yesterday in the workshop, uh, I also showed it uh, uh, on stage, but it's a little hard to show it here because we um, yeah, yeah, don't have that time and it's probably not all we have the taste because sometimes it takes a few tries. But a simple way to measure the speed of sound with this um, is to have two students, each of them has a smartphone. So one student sets up the smartphone on one side, then you have a measuring distance uh, to the second student. You do something like five meters, place the other phone here. And then one student claps their hands, or maybe a pops a balloon, or use uh, some of these um, wooden um, starting mechanisms which you use off to create a sound. Um, so the first one makes a sound, so both timers will start their measurement. Then the other one makes another sound and stops both measurements. And if you now think about this, the first one stops, uh, starts this stopwatch first. And the other one stops and starts a little bit later because of the time it takes for the sound to travel from here to there. And then when stopping, this one stops first and this one stops later. So this one starts early and stops later, so both measure at the same time, but this one has two times that uh, it takes the sound to travel from here to there on top of this. So, um, yeah, just waving in the air, so it might be a little bit hard to understand, but it's actually a very simple, uh, simple thought how to um, get the uh, time it takes for sound from here to there, and because the difference of both measurements and two times um, this, this travel time, because this phone starts a bit early and it stops a bit late again. So you only need two students, two smartphones, they simply need to clap in their hands, think a bit, and then um, with very simple math, you can drive the speed of sound. Um, without the necessity to think about resonance or anything like this, because there are quite a few publications on how to do um, uh, speed of sound measurements with smartphones, but they usually involve um, yeah, some, some resonance uh, thing, and um, yeah, if you know how to address speed of sound from resonance, you probably don't need to learn about the speed of sound at this point. Okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the acoustic stopwatch, um, and uh, I would suggest check this out because this is a really nice tool uh, that we really don't have here now. Um, okay, so at this point then <laughs> I should probably tell you how to get more information because uh, this was only a quick walk to what kind of experiments we can do. If you want to find out more, check out our website, uh, it's called feedbox.org. Um, on the next slides I will just to show you what kind of information you get there. And don't be afraid that the screenshots are in German, but everything is available in English as well. So it actually, the only thing which is not available in English are some uh, very few worksheets we created by our uh, bachelor students uh, for school, um, which were not created in English, but everything else in English. Um, so this is what our website looks like. And we've got a range of uh, tutorial videos which explain how to do this uh, more access thing, for example, with all the details on uh, different network types. Um, we've got a database of experiments, which you can also filter by yeah, either showing more experiments, but also only show the experiments with some videos in which uh, yeah, I will be demonstrating the experiment and explain how they work. And we've also got a wiki for those who want to really go into the depth of the uh, app which explain more details of the experiments and uh, where we all document our file format. As I said at the beginning, we have an editor with which you can change all the experiments and create your own experiments. 
And uh, if you want to go even more into details, you do not need to use our editor, but you can directly change our file format and this is also documented here. But this is one for those who want to um, yeah, go the whole way. Um, and then let me show to tell you uh, what our future plans are, because we just asked uh, quite often, and um, yeah, then I'm open for questions. Uh, because in short term, we want to improve the robotic. Um, if you have tried out our app, you might have noticed that it always shows all the data that has been recorded. So at the beginning, when I showed the accelerometer, I often stopped and deleted the data because we cannot zoom in right now, and that's what we're working on. We're working on Bluetooth support, so you can use external sensors and uh, also um, send the data from your phone to uh, other devices. And uh, we're working on an easier way to transfer the experiments where you can get it In the long term, yeah, we hope to support the camera at front day because we don't at the moment. And one thing, and uh, probably the most important takeaway from this side, is um, right now the app can also measure the data when it's exit. Okay, so as soon as you uh, go out of the app, or as soon as you turn off the, the screen, uh, the measurement stops, which is okay for most experiments, the ones I showed here, the one I will show outside. Um, but uh, for example, many uh, teachers wanted to uh, go to an amusement park with their students, and they measured if the force in the roller coaster ride. Right? And that's really difficult if you want to keep the screen on, not touch anything, but still push it to your pocket because the staff of the amusement park doesn't, isn't too amused if you are trying to keep your phone running and hold it in your hand to the roller coaster ride. Right? So it's also something we need to work on. And yeah, with that, um, I'm through with my talk. Once again, um, I really want to thank you to have the opportunity to uh, come all the way here and uh, talk to you. And um, I hope you could follow me, even though it wasn't a native language, neither for you nor for, nor, nor for me. Um, and I also hope that I uh, see a lot of you later after the, the tea break uh, on the outside to try out some hints uh, on activities. Um, as I said, I have to figure out myself where I have to go soon, but um, we will figure this out. And um, yeah, thank you all for, for your attention. <laughs>